Well, first of all, I want to say thank you to folks that gave me some change today. If you were here last week, we had our dear friend of our church and a dear friend of mine, Pastor David Ferranti, was here, and uh, he said that the people come up to him and give him a nickel, say, I pray for you for five days. And I said, well, if you want to give me a $500 bill, I'd even be better. But I'm just, <laughs> I'm just playing with you. But some people gave me some coins here. I guess I'm rattling in my pocket, which I appreciate your prayers so much. Thank you. And I appreciate you guys listening to that last week and participating with that. Well, today we're in our second part of our series about with honor. And we spoke about in the first week with honor that God has set up an authority structure and that when we honor his authority structure, structure excuse me, his blessing covers us. But if we don't honor the authority structure he's given us, which would be our government, which would be our family, our employer, employ, employers, things of that nature, we end up hurting ourselves. And the, the illustration we gave, as I ruined a perfectly good umbrella, was we mentioned the fact that it's like a covering, that if I honor the authority that's over me, like when you're a child, honor your parents so that it may go well with you. So I honor their authority. And while I do that, there's no authority except what God has given. And this is written, by the way, to a, uh, a Roman government, which was tyrannical, which was persecuting the church. And Paul said, submit yourself to governing authorities. Very unjust government. But if you do that and you honor God's authority, his covering is upon you. But what we often do is we're called and we're trained in our culture to dishonor authority. In fact, it's almost like a sport today. Uh, if you watch any comedian, I, you'd be hard-pressed to find a comedian that doesn't tear someone else apart to make you laugh, making fun of some politician, making fun of whoever. And so when we don't honor our parents, we don't honor the authority that God has given us, what we do is we end up poking holes in the covering that God has for us. And make no mistake, this covering is the blessings of God. And so when we do that, we actually poke holes in it, and we suffer consequences because we don't honor the authority that God has placed over us. And so one of the ways we can experience God's grace in our life is to honor the authority structures he's placed upon us. It doesn't mean we have to agree with everything. It doesn't mean that we don't take a stand for things, but when we take a stand, we do it with honor. We even mentioned the fact that when um, Michael was disputing over the um, body of Moses in the book of Jude, he said he didn't bring an accurate accusation against Satan, but he said, Satan, be gone. And the Bible talks about people not showing honor to anything. We need to be a people of honor and respect. It's something that we're not really called and, and talked about too much today, unfortunately. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed there's a lot of dishonor out there today? It's just amazing to me, no matter where you go, if you're smart and creative, tear someone apart. Make fun of them. I mean, just look at the television programs on television. If you watch Modern Family or watch Homer Simpson and the Simpsons, it's always making fun of the parents, and usually the biggest buffoon in the room is the man. And there's a disrespect for authority. There's a disrespect for the presidents that we've had and continue to have, and, and disrespect for all sorts of things. And people like it, they enjoy it, they listen to it, and they give in to it. And the next thing you know, we start tearing each other down. Do you know what we're doing as a nation? We're literally poking holes in God's covering and protection upon us. We should honor authority. We mentioned that the, first, first, the very first week. And so that's what we talked about, and we talked about how we can restore that. Well, today I want to talk about honoring our families and generations. Honoring our families. And you're saying, well, I'm, not, I'm single. Well, you're a part of a family because you're born. Right? Everyone had a family somehow, somewhere, or you would not be here. You had a mother and a father someplace. And so the Bible talks about that. I want to go back, back to the very beginning because really, as we look at the culture of honor and building that culture of honor, one of the foundation places we have to start with is God. We have to honor God first. The second thing we have to honor is our parents. It's a structure built upon it because what happened is this. The Bible talks about this in Ephesians, uh, quotes Exodus. It says this. You can put it up there, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Ephesians uh, 2. By the way, if I start coughing, um, I've been suffering with this little thing. I'm getting over it. Uh, Ephesians 2, 6, verses 2 and 3 says this. Honor your father and mother. That is the first commandment with a promise. We have the Ten Commandments, the Big Ten, and the first commandment with a promise was honoring your mother and father. The first thing is honoring God. Honor God, you know, know the gods before me and all that. And the fifth commandment is what? It says, honor your mother and your father that it may go well with you and you have a long life upon the earth. Now, 
If that happens, it's with a blessing. What happens, let's look at the opposite of this. What happens if we don't honor our mother and father? Instead of having blessings, you have what? Curses, exactly. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want any, I mean, I think life is hard enough to run without giving yourself more weights and more obstacles. The Bible is specific. The Bible is very clear about this. It's in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament. So I know today is not necessarily Father's Day or Mother's Day, but I really can't do this justice without dealing with the epicenter of, of honor, which starts with God and starts in the home. Because you think about it, where did government come from in the first place? Well, what first thing was God and man, right? Well, what did God create? I love Doug Weiss. He said, God, his last creation was marriage. God, man, and the woman together. Then they had children, and they had more children, and more children. And what happened then? There needed to be a structure to create order, because God's not a God of disorder, in a society. So there was clans, and there was patriarchs and matriarchs. Then later on, they started making nations, and they had kings and authority. Why? To help bring structure, to help bring order, so families could flourish, and people could do what God has asked them to do. So... Really, government is supposed to be a representative in some regards, not the total way, don't, don't take me out of context here, but it's supposed to support the family. And when the family is not strong, the government is not strong. And when the government is not strong, it hurts the family. You see how that all works? So, we have the hallmarks of societies based upon how the families treat each other and how you treat your mother and father is basically what happens for the rest of society is based upon how you treat your first authority structure you ever had. And it's so important. And I'm going to share with you in a few moments the journey I had to go through myself through this process. Some people are saying, you don't know how jerky my parents were. And I don't pretend to know. As a matter of fact, my wife and I, not in this church, make it very clear. And by the way, if I ever give an example, I am not giving it to uh, anyone in this church. People often think that happens. That's not the case. And if I do, I ask permission. But another church, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, my wife and I were in a different church, and we were counseling this young lady that was struggling with all kinds of issues. And we found out um, that she was sexually molested by her father. When she began to tell me the story with my wife there, I began to get infuriated. There's very few things that boil in my blood as when you're taking care of when people um, don't, don't protect the innocent, such as children and the old. That really gets to me. And I was getting so angry, I wanted to gather a posse together and pump this scum back down. That's where I started thinking. Okay, I'm just being honest with you, okay? I'm being honest with you. But then I realized that one of the steps, we were taking it through the steps of, of forgiveness and being free in Christ, which, by the way, we're going to have something like that in the fall. I'm excited about it. Uh, encar encountering God and getting rid of the junk in your life. And one of the things was forgiveness, and she had to forgive her father. And we tried to tell her, listen, you're not saying what your dad did was correct. What he did was wrong, and he needs to be brought to justice unless he hurt somebody else. But you need to honor the fact that he's still your dad. He gave you life. You don't have to honor what he's done. But you have to forgive him. Let him deal with the consequences, but you have to get that out of you. And of course, and, and, and by God's grace, she forgave him. And she felt a release, and she, her depression stopped going, her depression decreased incredibly. Anxiety stopped happening. Why? She honored the structure, even though it was a faulty structure. I don't know if that makes any sense. Like, I'm trying to help you understand. It's a, I can't think of anything worse than a parent abusing a child like that. I, I just can't. To me, it just takes the, it's horrible. And I'd have no idea how I would respond to that. But I know what the Word of God says. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Honor those above you. And when you think about it, if, a great uh, story of honor, if you remember, you're reading through the Bible together with us this year. We, we're going through it. We're in 2 Samuel. We went through David, running from Saul. Well, that's a great story about honoring uh, a leadership that's totally not right. Said, I would not touch God's anointed. This guy was trying to kill him for no probable cause. And he refused to go against God's anointed. He said, God will take care of it. I'm going to show respect to my covering. Amazing story. Amazing story. And God honored David as a result of that. Big time. In fact, the Davidic line, I mean, Christ comes through the line of David. So, I'm saying all this because we're going to look at a few minutes about honoring the parents and then how the parents honor the family and how honor happens in the house. Now, 
One of the things to bring honor is to bring weight and significance to something. That when you honor something, you give, you spend time with it, it's important to you. If you don't, you take it for granted. We also mentioned last week about Jesus. It's, this is a very, very important principle. I hope we understand this about honor. It's Jesus, it said this in the scriptures. He could do no great miracles. Jesus could not do something. Why? He said, a prophet is not without honor, except from his own family, his own house, his own town. And where there's no honor, you, you miss God's blessings. I'm convinced if we will continue to grow, and I need to grow in this as well, we learn to honor God, honor our authority, and honor each other, God's grace will be here. God's grace is ability to do things you cannot do on your own that God provides for you. That's what grace is. Unmerited favor, help, things of that nature. And so that's all part of it. So it talks about that honor, your mother and father. And in Ephesians, it says this. Ephesians 5.21. It says, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. And showing, showing uh, giving others, thinking of others higher than yourself. It says also in the scriptures, uh, in, we'll get back to 5.21 in a little bit, but John 13, 34, and 35 says this. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I've loved you. You should show love to each other. Your love for one another will prove the world that you are my disciples. And part of love is honor and respect. Really, you don't have love without honor. In fact, uh, if you look at the scripture, I never saw anyone come to Christ in the New Testament, in the gospel stories, without Christ showing them honor one way or another. Think about it. While we were at sinners, Christ gave us honor, didn't he? He died for us while we were sinners. And so that's all part of the process of this. I like what it also says in Romans, and we're going to break it down in a few minutes and get a little deeper into this, but I want to give you some foundation scriptures first. In Romans 12, 10 says this, love each other with genuine affection and take delight in dishonoring each other. Oh, I'm sorry. Take delight in honoring each other, giving preference to each other. It's like when you open the door for you, no, you go, no, you go. I mean, I love when I go out to eat with somebody. I try to pay the bill, they try to pay the bill. I, I try to pay the bill, they try. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. You say, okay, you got it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But you never do that? You're trying to honor somebody. You want to honor. So if I go out with you, I'll go, oh, yeah. Then, no, I'm just kidding. But it's an honor to, to do that. You know, it's a, I mentioned opening doors for, for ladies and showing respect to the, you know, opening the car door for your wife, and, uh, which I do occasionally. And so I am, by no means am I a perfect honorer. But you know what? I want to be. Because Christ honors us if we honor him in the authority structures he has placed before us. You see, it's very simple this. The foundation of authority comes from God. And then comes family, church, government. That's how it works. So honor your mother and father. Now, honor in the home it, what does it mean to dishonor? To dishonor is to treat ordinary like it's no big deal. That's what they did to Oh, that Jesus. And how easy is it, guys and ladies, to dishonor the home, to take for granted that food is on the table, to take for granted that mom and dad are giving you clothes, it's, take for granted that you can go drive your car, take for granted that your needs are being met, that you can, go, you can sit there and play with their phones and drain their batteries so when someone calls, they have to, people think you're being rude because you hang up on them. I mean, I mean, things like that. I mean, you think about how parents do all that. It's a wonderful blessing. And we need to honor what has been done for us. And what does it mean to do that? Treat as ordinary. And you know, it's very easy for us to do this. Think about this. When I first, got, when I first met Sandra, I would comb the little hair. I, I had a little more hair back there. But I'd comb my hair and put on a little Brute by Fabergé. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't put that on. No, Brute by Fabergé, Dakar, or Obsession, or something like that. I put on some cologne, and I'd get the cool-looking clothes, and I'd wash the car, wax the car, vacuum it, go and see her, and be very nice, brush my teeth, chew gum, look good, you know, to be nice. Now, what would happen if I would have picked her up like some of us, you know, you just get there, you're all sweaty, you cut the grass, you come in, you throw your shoes down, you put them on the, put them on the thing, you, you begin to um, do things that I don't want to talk about in church, and, and you're sloppy, you got dirt all, hey, honey, how you doing? Hey, can, can I talk to you? I'm busy right now. And you're watching Sports Center, and she wants to talk to you, 
And, and that's all. How about this, uh, ladies? So how about this? And I'm, don't get me wrong here. How about you find a bathrobe that was handed down to you by three generations, and your husband comes home, and you're wearing his awful, ugly bathrobe. When you first met him, you got dressed. You wore your hair nice. You wore nice clothes. You put, you put perfume on. You, look, you spent two, three hours in front of the mirror, and you honored him and how you presented yourself. Nah, we just dismissed my husband. But meanwhile, we'll go to work. We'll look good, men and women. We'll, we'll dress ourselves well. We'll smell good. We'll look good. We'll come on time. We'll be pleasant. And all that kind of stuff for people that are not that really, they're important, but they're not the center of our life. And we take for granted what God has given us. That's showing dishonor. Now, that's, I'm not suggesting we, we have to walk around like we just got out of a, um, a Land's End magazine. But what I am suggesting is when we begin to treat each other ordinary, when we take each other for granted, when we stop being thankful, it leads us to a place where we show dishonor. Where we show dishonor, God's presence dissipates. Because God's attracted to honor. Because God is a God that honors. So that's what begins to happen. And so I promise you, if you want a common or an ordinary marriage, just treat him ordinary. And I, you know, listen, I, I struggle with this. I wish I was better at it. It's very easy to treat people ordinary. But we should be thinking how we can treat respect to them. But I want to go back to the first commandment with a blessing. Honor your father and mother, Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and mother that your days will be long upon the land which the Lord has given you. And here's the big idea. I think if you could love your parents, you could love anybody. Think about it. If you could love your parents, well, I have good parents. Why don't you just tell me? If you can love your parents, you can learn to love everybody. Why? That is the incubator. That is the lab. That is the training ground where you and I learn to deal with authority and how to deal with it. And if we can love and respect, it helps us everywhere else. It just does. So that's part of it. A lot of modern parenting is based on the teaching of Sigmund Freud, who basically suggests we need to kill the father inside of us and deliver ourselves from all this tyrannical, you know, we have to be free of that. And also, another thing that happens in our society today is this. We, what you tend to idolize, you tend to demonize the opposite. What you tend to idolize, for example, in our culture, we idolize youth. We just do. I mean, we idolize youth. And so what do we dishonor? The old. I'm sorry, the mature. Right? What happens to the elderly? What happens to people? We make fun of them, don't we? Come on, let's be honest here. We work so hard to be in the youth culture that we don't honor the, the elderly. You know, my brother, uh, wife's from Japan, and I've been to other parts of the world, where they honor those that go before them. If an, if an older person comes in the room, they'd stand up and show honor. In different cultures, you, you go like this, you show honor to somebody when they're older than you are. In our culture, it's just like, ah, it's just the old, just throw them away, they're old remnants. You know what happens when we do that? We close down God's blessing upon us. Why? Because God wants us to honor the older people as well. So that's all part of it. So Deuteronomy says something else about honoring mother and daughter. And again, I'm bringing it back down to this because this, next to God, the second most important element in learning honor is through your parents. It's just in the Bible. And it makes sense. If you look at the logic of how this is all flowing, you see how it flows? God, family, society. And remember we mentioned, if you dishonor the covering that God has given you, you dishonor God because God has put that covering there. All right. Now, let's look a little further here. Uh, it says in Deuteronomy 27, 16, cursed is anyone who dishonors his father or mother. That's pretty clear, I, I think, right? And all the people would reply, amen. That was all the parents, by the way. No. Um, Exodus 21, 17, again, we don't follow these, these laws now. This was, the, uh, this was under the um, laws of the Old Testament, a different set of circumstances, but the principle still applies. Anyone, Exodus 20, 21, 17, anyone who dishonors his father or mother must be put to death. Okay. Now, let me tell you a little story about me um, and what the, the journey I had to walk through. Sometimes we don't know what's going on in our lives until God shines his light upon it. 
I've had a number of circumstances in my life that I have learned through the reading of the Word of God. That's why I want to encourage you, everybody. I read through the Bible every year. Uh, just jump on with this. Start where you are. I'm telling you, every day, just about every day, I'm getting blessed. And one day I was reading. I was a young guy, fresh out of seminary. I, 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 um, I despised small churches and small ministries. I wanted to go big time. I wanted to go to the big leagues. So I worked for a church of 6,000 people with a, with a prominent evangelical pastor that later, later on fell into sin, unfortunately. But at the time, he was on, his, he was on the rise. I was his personal assistant. I, it, was, I mean, it was an amazing story how I got out there. And when I was out there, I started to run into a little bit of a problem. I had a hard time with authority. I, I find myself kind of always wanting to kick against it, kind of want to rebel. Just something in me, this was rebellious. I don't know what it was, and I get intimidated. It was a weird set of circumstances, and what happened was I was reading the Bible, and the Bible began to read me. Listen, I, I, I'm going to say another advertisement here. If you want to grow in Christ, there's three things you have to, four things you have to do, and this has nothing to do with my sermon. I'm going to bring it up anyhow. If you want to grow in Christ, you need to read the Bible, you need to pray, you need to be in fellowship with other believers, and you need, you need to share what you're learning and reaching out. You do those four things, I guarantee you, you will grow in your relationship with Christ. And so, um, what happened, I was reading the Bible, and I came to Proverbs 20, 20. And this is what it says. I'm going to look it up in the uh, New King James Version. If you put it up there for me, I'd appreciate it. Whoever curses his father or his mother, his lamp will be put out in deep darkness. When I read that scripture, something in me broke. Because God says, there it is. I was struggling at that time with a bit of darkness in my life. I was down, things weren't going like, like I wanted them to go. I was struggling with authority structure. And God said, there it is. And I began, I don't normally cry. I'm not kind of a guy that, I mean, I get emotional about my kids and family and things like that. But normally I don't really do that. I started to like weep. And God hit me or something. I began to cry by myself in my study time over the scriptures. I began to cry. I said, God, I, I realized that God said, that's you. You're the one doing this. You're, not, you're, you're cursing your parents. I said, how did I do that? Proverbs 20, 20 says in New Living Translation, if you insult your father or mother, your light will be put in the outer darkness. And, and I was thinking, I just began to do that. And you're thinking, well, Pastor, I didn't know that about you. Well, let me explain. I had never verbally showed disrespect to them in a way that would be out of the ordinary. I never showed disrespect that way. I, I would make little cutting and sarcastic remarks about what they would say. Yeah, Daddy, whatever. Yeah, Mom, whatever. I just, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? You know, hey, the teenage 14, <laughs> you know, they roll the eyes. Or whatever. I did some of that. But I began to think, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. My dad's in a puny little church, and, and what happened was this. This is what happened. I grew up as a pastor's kid, and my dad was the kind of guy who wouldn't fight back. He just, he get plummeted by people in the church. It's just, it's saddest thing. And, and unfortunately, I, I got hurt as a result of it. Some of the residual hit me. And I began to despise church. And oh, let me give you an example. Um, if a Someone like Alex Rodriguez, who we spent, whatever it was, 120 million, whatever it is we spent on the guy. For the New York Yankees, it's, it's tragic. Okay, he gets up to the plate, and he starts striking out. What, what, do the, what do the fans do? They boo. Why? He's not performing like they wanted to perform. And so when I saw my father being kicked around and beat up and all that, he literally wasn't being, but I'm just saying, you know. Of course, my dad didn't see it that way, but that's how I saw it. Isn't it funny how kids interpret circumstances? That's how I interpreted it. And I didn't like the church, period. I didn't. I wanted to go get away from these small little yakety churches and get some place where they're really playing it right. They're in the major leagues. None of this farm system stuff, you know? So that's what I was thinking. And, and, so, and, and so when I began to think about that, the Lord said, you have shown dishonor to them and how you thought about them in your mind, how you talk about them in your mind, how you, how you cut them up in your mind, sarcasm, sark, flesh, chasm, breaking apart. Sometimes sarcasm is like taking a, a tongue and a whip and whipping someone in the flesh, and that's what sarcasm often does. And I come from Long Island, New York. I'm pretty sarcastic in my upbringing. You know, you try to outdo each other, and some of it's in good fun, but usually it has a little sarcasm. Sark, flesh, chasm, you're ripping. And so I showed dishonor. So I, I cried out to the Lord. I don't know how long it was, an hour or whatever. And I felt the Lord say, 
This is when cell phones just first came out. You know, the old, remember the old, de the analog one? So I actually got on there and, and I, I called the home and I said, hey, Dad, I, I need to talk to you. He said, what's the matter, son? You, don't, you sound like you're upset. I said, Dad, I, I ask you, Mom, I need to ask your forgiveness because I've, I've, hit, I, you know, I've showed disrespect to you. I was like, what are you talking about? You show respect to me. No, I've showed disrespect to you and how I've spoken about you, how I've looked at you, how I've viewed you. I said, I've been wrong, Dad. Will you please forgive me? And I began to cry, and else and the other. He said, son, of course I forgive you. I, he's like, I had no idea. You know, he like, had no idea what was going on. It was an issue of the heart, you see. You know, it's like the little boy that is told, you need to sit down. The boy sits down and goes, I may be sitting down on the outside, but inside I'm standing up. And so many times, it's not what we're doing on the outside, it's what's in our heart that will eventually determine the outside. And so as I began to cry out to God, and, and, and I, I asked for forgiveness, and my dad said, sure, we're fine, we prayed, I felt a relief and a release, and the darkness that was plaguing me lifted. It, basically, I was under a curse, and I didn't realize it. All of a sudden, I started getting along with people on the authority over me. I, the authority problems I had got better. And then all of a sudden, guess what, I, guess what the next step was? It's one thing to repent and pray. Guess, guess what the next stage of my life was? Guess what I did? I ended up working with my dad for two years in a small church that was struggling and started growing because I can't, no, I'm just kidding. That's not the reason why. No, it, it, it was a church that was, my dad, my dad was like a missionary. He'd go in these horrible, he'd go in these churches that were so broken and messed up and he'd go in there and introduce the gospel and introduce the Holy Spirit. It's a great, did great works. So I ended up going home with him and worked with him for two years. It's one thing to say, God, forgive me. It's another thing to walk it out in everyday life. And as a result of doing that, I learned to be under his authority you know what? And I, that stuff kept coming up again because I was in the major league and, and I'll show you how to do the church, Dad. Yeah, right. Like I knew what I was talking about. I still don't know what I'm talking about. And that's probably my strength because I realize I don't know everything. So as a result of that, I was blessed. And now a relationship with my father and mother is very, very good. There was another scenario that happened a little while ago. My, my wife's like, what's your deal with your mother? Every time you talk to your mother is an issue. And I realized that I harbored other stuff. I let it go. My mother and I get along great now. Okay, and what you're going to find is that we're like onions. You, you, you know, you get clean, all of a sudden God goes, there's something else there. And I'm always getting peeled back. There's always something new that I need to get freer. God wants to see us freer and to live a more vibrant life. And that happens by letting the Holy Spirit probe us and to cleanse us. You will never be perfect. And so if you're not having these revelations in your life, and if you're not having other stuff come off your life, then I wonder if you're really letting the Lord look at you. Apostle Paul says, woe am I, the chief of sinners. And here's a guy that is amazing, right? The closer you get to God, the more light there is, the more you see. And it's an opportunity not to be condemned, but an opportunity for freedom by honoring the honor structure. And so Jesus said this. You know, it, it says, uh, please, we're going to finish this off here in a little bit. Matthew 15, um, 3, Jesus replied, He's talking to the Pharisees who were really about offerings and all that. They were about helping the temple. That's what he said. And why do you by your tradition violate the direct commandments of God? For instance, God says, honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father and mother must be put to death. But you say it's all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you. For I have vowed to give to God what I have given to you. In this way, you say they don't need to honor their parents. And so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition, you hypocrites. I think it's awfully sad that we just forget about mom and dad. Eh, whatever. I think we have a responsibility to make sure our parents are taken care of. That's showing honor, that we take care of people that can't take care of themselves. How do you honor God? By honoring the poor by helping the poor, helping the hungry. That's why we give, and that's why we want to do more, by helping those that can't help themselves. You know, Malachi 4, 6 says this, I will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a curse. There's something about honoring is vitally important. So we need to develop a culture of honor. The culture of honor in Romans 12, 10. I'm just I'm getting ready, guys. We'll get started here in a few minutes. Uh, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. Honor each other. Submitting to one another in the reverence of Christ. And then it goes, you know, it says submitting to another and the reverence of Christ in Ephesians 5, 21. Then we get to the, the whole, this 
Women, you know, submit to your husbands and all this. Before he even gets into that, what does he say? Honor each other. Submit to each other in the, the honor of Christ. Everything comes from honor. In Colossians, it says this. It says, uh, Ephesians uh, 6, 1 through 5. Children, obey your parents, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, that it may go well with you. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So there is this, they honor the parents, and parents, you need to honor the weaker vessels there by showing them love and discipline. So it's our responsibility to honor each other, honor the poor, honor the children, honor the elderly, right? We need to honor each other, and when we honor each other and think of others higher than ourselves, what does it do? It promotes God's blessings, his favor, his presence, where he can do many great things. How many of you want God to do great things in your family, in the church? I do. How does that happen? By developing a culture of honor. Because how I treat you ultimately determines how I treat Christ. And that's the truth of the matter. And so learning to honor each other. Well, how do we do that? How do we create a culture of honor at the home? How on earth do we do that? You can also look for the sake of time. Colossians 3.21 talks about that, about honoring the home and all that. But how do we do it in a home? Well, we honor God by putting him first. We honor God by giving everything to him first. Honoring by our money, by our time, and our behavior. And that's all part of it. And I just wanted to conclude this. I do want to read a little Colossians. Colossians 3, uh, 18 says this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as fitting in the Lord. Husbands, agape your wives, which means self-sacrificed love which gives without expecting anything in return. That's agape love. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter towards them. Children, obey your parents in all things. This pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. This is honoring. You see how this wonderful thing? Honor, 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 honor. And so bond servants, obey all things of your masters according to the flesh. So this is all part of it, which comes back here to the very end here, is this. John 13, 34 through 35, and now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I loved you. You should love each other. Your love will prove you're my disciples. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to thank you for the experiences that you have brought me through. I also want to thank you for the experience of the Bible, which speaks to us. Lord, we recognize and we're, we are reminded today, or perhaps we learn today, that we must honor our parents. Whether they were dishonorable or not, we have to honor the position that they have. And so, Lord, right now, we just take an opportunity to ask you to forgive us. Some of you are going to have to make some phone calls perhaps today and say, forgive me, or write a letter. They've died. And give it to the Lord. Father, right now, we just want to just ask for your forgiveness for not honoring our parents and honoring authority that you've placed upon us. Lord, we don't want to be under a curse. We want to be under your blessing. And most of all, my question to you today, have you honored Christ by giving him your life? Not just believe in Christ, but saying, Jesus, not only do I believe in you, but I'm giving my life to you. You're the boss. You're the commander. You're the chief. Today can be your day. Maybe you've walked away from Christ. I'm going to pray a prayer right now. If you would just pray this together. Maybe that's you. Just bow your heads real quick. If you say, Pastor, you know what? I don't think I've ever given my life totally to Christ. I need to do that. I want to honor him today. Or maybe I've fallen away and I've been living for myself and I'm sick of it. I want to live for Christ. Can I just get a quick show of hands? Just real quick. Real quick. Anyone here this morning? Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that you're a good God, that you love us, that you've come to give us life, an abundant life. You've come to love us. And Father, we thank you. You died on the cross to set us free from our sins. We ask right now that you forgive us of all of our sins. We acknowledge the fact that we have fallen short of what you've told us to do. We ask you to forgive us because of your great love. And we choose to give our lives afresh to you. Wash us, cleanse us, and make us whole today. 
in Jesus' name. And we, by your power and grace, choose to follow you. Amen. And amen.